All right, so I got a little bit more done on the transmission. I didn't really film anything on the forward drum or the pump. I basically just did the aluminum piston with five clutches in the forward. I wasn't able to fit the sixth one in there, and I didn't really want to do a thinner steel, so I just went with the five and the aluminum piston. I added the Extreme Automatics pump saver plate in the pump on this one. We do have the billet input shaft, and I'm just about ready to start doing the valve body. So I'm going again with my Jake's D3 that I have. Uh, if you guys have been following for a while, you know kind of the issues that I was having with this thing. So I was actually having issues with this thing binding and not releasing the trans brake, and I would have to come all the way down on RPM just to get the trans brake to release. So I did a lot of different stuff with it and actually tested the trans brake on two different transmissions. So this was originally in the Escalade, and I sold the Escalade now. And I wanted to verify that it wasn't a transmission internal issue. So for the dual feed on the transmission, I put the plug in the case and then put a stock valve body back on it. And that truck is still running like that right now with that valve body and everything on it. So it wasn't an internal issue with the transmission. I swapped the valve body over to the Ranger. And the issues with the valve body followed over to the 4L80 on the Ranger. And that's actually the main reason that this truck is down and has been down for a while and been getting rebuilt. Because when I started making progress on it, the torque converter failed. Then I just kept the truck down and ripped the whole truck apart. So what I ended up doing to get the thing to kind of work was I swapped out the shift solenoids that are used for the trans brake. So the trans brake came with a different style solenoid. It was like a trans star, I think is the name. And it was not a factory AC Delco solenoid. So I put a set of AC Delco solenoids in for the trans brake section in this aluminum block here. So I replaced these solenoids with AC Delco and then it actually started releasing. I didn't have problems with it binding or releasing anymore after that. Um, and I was doing test hits with it and that's when the converter failed. It did send a bunch of metal through this thing. So I spent like five hours cleaning this thing the other day and going through all the circuitry, pulled all of the valves out of it, all of the springs, everything completely clean. Just making sure that it's clean and I don't have any issues with it. Along with that, I built this little vacuum tester. So I'll be using that in this video. And basically I can use this little plate to go over the cavities on the valve body and then test the vacuum and make sure that there's no leaks or anything inside the valve body. But before I get to that, I want to talk about these solenoids. So while I was spending a lot of time cleaning that thing, I had a lot of time to think about what could possibly be causing that binding or locking up issues. So what I did was I took the AC Delco solenoid and I took the Transtar solenoid and I took them apart because I wanted to see the major differences. We'll start with these first. These are the return springs for the little solenoid. So you can see one is a bigger one, one's a little bit skinnier but it's taller. And this version over here, this is the Transtar solenoid. This is the AC Delco solenoid. So this is, gets assembled like this. Basically when you activate the solenoid, it pushes the solenoid out and then there's a little ball inside of here that closes this hole and blocks the fluid flow through the solenoid. So a couple things besides the springs that I wanted to point out. Here you can see this little plunger has two relief slots in it. And this one only has one little small flat one. So these are pretty large. There's two of them. So this thing does travel back and forth. And this passage in here is hollow and can fill up with fluid. So this doesn't travel very far, but this is soaked in fluid. If this does move out, that spring pressure has to push against the fluid to get that plunger to go back. So this has two larger relief holes. This one has a smaller one, and I did test this actually in some water, and I just held this out like this, filled it with water and dropped them. And this one drops nice and quick, just straight down like that. And this one here drops at, I don't know, less than half the speed. You can see it kind of just like float down like that. So the return speed is a lot slower but it doesn't have very far to travel. The other big difference I noticed was, I might just insert a picture here because it might be a little bit easier to see, but if you look at the position of the ball on this Transtar one versus the position of the ball on the AC Delco solenoid on the left, you can see that there's a lot more area that this ball can move around in, and this one barely has any area for that ball to move around. So if I take this plate and I cover this, cover this thing up, you can see that the ball doesn't really have a whole lot of room to move. And if the ball is pushed forward, it's blocking this hole. And then when you release the solenoid, the ball is supposed to move away and then it exhausts the fluid back out, out these ports. But 
if this ball can't physically move out of the way, it's not going to move out of the way and, and exhaust the fluid the way it's supposed to. Like, it might still exhaust some fluid, but is it is it enough? That's kind of the question. So, this one can move like half the distance of the ball, move completely out of the way. And here you can see the light all the way through it on the back side, so there's a nice big cavity in there for that ball to be able to slide back far enough. Now you can't really see through it because the ball has slid back, but that ball has a nice distance it can travel out of the way, so it has a lot more room to exhaust through all of these ports. This one, with this plate basically sitting right on top of it, doesn't really have much room to exhaust. So these solenoids go in the top here, and there's two other ports. There's one infeed, which is like an orifice hole here. It has a set screw with a hole in it, and then this one is open. That goes over the top of these holes here, this one is like your line pressure and then that one I believe is what goes to activate the, the brake. So which would be the reverse band and direct drum. So that's these two passages here, which this is like a line passage and then this passage here goes over to this valve. So my understanding is when, when you hit the button it activates the solenoids, blocks fluid flow from this one to transfer it into here and then this one is what goes to activate the rest of the brake. This passage over here leads to this valve so when this valve gets pushed over I'm guessing it bleeds fluid into this long passage here. So you have a plug in this section this whole long port here is actually connected from the factory you can see that there's a plug drilled in there machine down and then this passage is open so this passage here is now connected which brings you to these two holes on the valve body so you can see the markings on the valve body from this passage go over to this passage. And then this passage here is actually this long passage here which is all machined out. So basically fluid goes in there and then it goes through this machine passage through this check ball valve inside here and then connects to this reverse passage. So that would be one circuit and then this hole here comes over I believe to this passage here which this passage also connects to down where this pressure switch is. Which would make sense, because when you hit the button, that would send fluid to this pressure switch. This pressure switch would then activate the wire to the harness, which would activate the shift solenoid. I think that's how that works. All right, so now that I've explained that, so hypothetically, let's say you have solenoids that activate, but they don't exhaust the fluid pressure the way that they should because the hole is blocked off. So it might relieve some of the pressure, but there might be residual pressure, residual fluid in there, or it's bleeding it off slowly. So that may be at times building up and then activating this pressure switch. On the back side of this pressure switch, it says 110 on it. So I'm guessing it's a 110 PSI switch. So you could have fluid building up in that passage, activating that switch, uh, changing your shift solenoid position, and that all could be happening because that sh these shift solenoids that were in here were not relieving the pressure or exhausting the pressure the way that they should be. That would also explain why in my case when I would release the button I would have to bring the RPM all the way down to idle for it to release and actually roll forward. Uh, another couple things I found this filter was all blown out so this filter wasn't really doing anything. This is the like actuator feed circuit so there's a passage down here and it comes up goes through this filter so this filter was all blown out. This filter is all full of metal, which could probably be from my converter. So I just went through and cleaned all that stuff up. My description of how this thing works, uh, take it with a grain of salt. I don't know if that's exactly how it functions, but that's kind of my guess from looking at the circuitry. And I just did that because I wanted to try to understand how those symptoms could happen in order for me to try to help troubleshoot it and verify that it was actually a solenoid problem because I am putting this back in and I don't want to have the same problems. So hopefully a good cleaning, good solenoids, we won't have to worry about it anymore. All right, so this is the little valve body vacuum tester that I built. So this is just plexiglass that I had laying around in the garage, just kind of cut it down into that shape, and then I uh, fine grit sanded the bottom of it, just a couple NPT fittings. This is actually like a silicone pad. It's like an electronics pad, silicone pad. This little guy right here, thermal pad, 100 millimeter by five millimeter. I guess it's for like circuit boards or something. But it's real nice and squishy, sticky. It seals really well. It was like eight bucks on eBay. And then I just picked up some hardware store line. Stuff was like 30 cents a foot. The aluminum block there is actually the piece that I cut off my intercooler. 
So if you remember when I chopped the end tank off the intercooler to make it come out the bottom, that was the piece that I cut off. I just used some scrap aluminum plate, made some plugs for the ends of it, and then popped some fittings in there. A vacuum gauge, and then two fittings on it. So this is for calibrating. It's basically just like a bleed fitting. So you can adjust this, you can adjust airflow, you can adjust the amount of vacuum that it's pulling with this one. But this will give you some adjustability so it's not too, pulling too much or too little vacuum. I did buy this vacuum pump. I did buy it just for this, but it'll work. This is actually one of them Amazon special AC vacuum pump setups. So I did recently buy a crimping tool to do AC lines and I plan to do AC lines on this truck. So I figured might as well just get the vacuum pump with the AC lines and then I can dual purpose use it for testing valve bodies. I did set it up with the union fitting here so I can just unscrew this right here and then this whole thing comes off and then it won't really affect the pump too much. You can do this all just with fittings though, just with hardware store fittings. I, I saved like probably $20 just doing the aluminum thing, but you could just use a T on it. There's some DIY examples of valve body vacuum testers on the Googles. All right, so let's give this thing a little rip here. So what I'm gonna do, I already tested all these, so I know that they all work decent. So you can see how hard I was kind of pulling to get that thing off of there. This is nice and sticky. And I just put a hole in it. So I'm going to test this hole right here. This is the actuator feed limit hole. What I'm going to do is basically cover this up and kind of smash it down around the hole so it doesn't leak into the next passage. Put that down over the top of it and turn the pump on. And just make sure it's not leaking around any of the seams. You can kind of push it down. You see it's pulling about 20 inches. So that's pulling about 20 inches of vacuum, so that should be good. Uh, I guess you want it to pull close to 20. If it's pulling like 15, then that would be bad. But basically all you're doing is you're testing between these passages because these valves do slide back and forth, but they seal against the walls. So they should bleed through a little bit, but not a whole lot. So if you're pulling too much air through there, that means you got a leak. So you seal the pad completely around the hole, pull the vacuum on the hole, and make sure that it's not sucking air like from a different passage. This hole here was the actuator feed limit hole, and this one does have the upgraded Sonex uh, actuator feed limit, which is basically a larger bore, and it's it's kind of hogged out. So if the actuator feed limit valve is bleeding into other circuits, it can cause you shifting issues. This is the Jake's D3. It did come with the upgraded actuator feed limit already in it, so that's good. And from what I can tell, it looks like all of the circuits are working, so I tested actuator feed limit, I tested the shift valves, and everything seems to be pretty good. So that's pretty much it for this one. I do also have a CK performance trans brake here. So this is this, what the CK kit looks like, and I think I'll do a separate video. I might go through and just kind of talk about the differences between the CK and the Jake's D3 brake. So this one goes on here, the solenoid goes up in this little guy right here. So the plates are different, valve body's different. But these are like the only two, or at least the most well-known auto shifting 480 trans brakes on the market right now. There might be another one on the market that I'm not thinking of right now, but it's not like there's a whole lot of these out there. So I think it might be cool to kind of compare the two while I have them both in my hands. So let me know what you guys think about that idea. If you made it to the end of the video, 